Hello everyone, this is Bob and Threadbear, and welcome back to Weaving Worlds. For today's topic, I'm going to focus on a fact that you can use both for your settings and for your stories. Every nation has a beginning, and a lot of those beginnings are interesting and have a story attached to them. You can then use these origin stories to inform the character of a nation and its relationship with its neighbors as a backdrop for a more personal story you want to tell or as the centerpiece of your story. But while every nation's origin is unique, they do tend to fall into a few broad categories that you can draw upon to build your setting. The following examples should hopefully get you thinking along the right lines, but before I begin, let me first make something clear. Each of these categories is not mutually exclusive. A particular nation's origin could involve several of them at once, and by invoking multiple categories you can create a very interesting national origin story with plenty of twists and turns. Alliances The earliest city-states formed when one or more tribes decided to centralize their trading and their political apparatuses into a single convenient hub. Babylon, for instance, was founded by a local tribe, and was nothing more than a minor commercial hub until the days of Hammurabi. Grecian cities like Knossos and Athens were inhabited for centuries or even millennia, and became cities over time as the locals prospered and their buildings grew in both size and complexity. And while it's admittedly much rarer, some modern nations have also formed out of alliances. The United States of America puts it right there in the name. There were 13 individual, independently governed colonies that decided to band together and rebel against the English crown all at the same time. And after they succeeded, they agreed to create a central government that would keep the newly formed states together. This agreement is why states in the United States have a lot more power and independence compared to the provinces of other nations. And the same is largely true of India. While several regions of colonial India decided to break away and form their own nations, such as Pakistan and Bangladesh, most of them stuck together and formed the modern nation of India. Invasion Every once in a while, a population invents a new combat technique or experiences a population boom, and when they do, they invade their neighbors to form new nations and new empires. The Persians under Cyrus the Great invaded the Babylonian Empire to create the first Persian Empire, and then Alexander the Great invaded the Persian Empire to usher in the Hellenistic period. And then the Romans conquered all of the Mediterranean Sea to create the Roman Empire, and then there's the Norse in England, the Franks in Palestine, the Mongols in China, the Spanish in Mexico, and so on. Nations formed by invasions tend to be unstable, since the ruling class is foreign and unwelcome. As such, they tend to either dissolve within a few generations, get reconquered by a more local power, or else suffer through decades of civil wars and uprisings. But while the political impact is usually temporary, the cultural impact of an invasion can last forever. Roman culture and the Latin language are unifying touchstones throughout Western Europe. Russia as a nation would not exist if the Slavic city-states hadn't had to unify to throw off the Mongols, and while the Arabian Empire was only unified for around a hundred years, the majority religion in most of the regions it held is still Islam. Dynastic Takeover During the European Middle Ages and up through the Enlightenment Age, one of the most widely considered and important qualifications for leadership was a person's dynasty, the family that they belonged to. Because of this, control of an estate, or even an entire country, would often fall into foreign hands, because the closest surviving relative of a ruler was the king of some far-off country. One way the Spanish Empire gained power in Europe was by intermarrying with other Catholic monarchs and then claiming their lands. At various times, Spain would claim Portugal, southern Italy, Sardinia, Belgium, and the Netherlands as part of their patrimony, and at one point they tried to invade England. England also went through this situation between the Tudor and Stuart dynasties. When Queen Elizabeth I died, she had no direct heirs and no surviving siblings. However, what she did have was a cousin in Scotland, King James Stuart, and so when she died, the nations of Scotland and England were peacefully unified under a single ruler. His family would later be deposed and effectively stripped of power by the English Civil War and Glorious Revolution, but that's a different story. Revolution Revolutions come in a lot of different flavors. Revolts, civil wars, insurrections, popular uprisings, and so on. 
And there is a lot of nuance that separates each type, but I'd need a whole new video if I wanted to get into all of that. I might just do that at some point. But for now, we're boiling it down to the essential details. A lot of people are unsatisfied with the current government, and they plan to do something about it by either replacing the current government, or by separating themselves from it. In the former case, a nation may have the same borders and use the same name as before, but it is a new nation, because the government has changed. Maybe a nation once ruled by a distant empire is now ruled by locals, or maybe the old monarchy has been deposed and replaced with a democratic republic. In the case of secession, the new nation will be a piece of the old nation, like South Sudan or Panama. Now, of course, there are also situations where a civil war fails, or else it replaces the ruler and not the form of government, but since that's not the start of a new nation, that's not what we're talking about today. Colonization During the Antiquity Era, the Mediterranean Sea was full of colonies founded by Greeks, Phoenicians, and a few other sedentary cultures. Some colonies learned to live with the local tribes, others of them excluded the locals and pushed them out, but in both cases, they were effectively independent of the city-states that sent them out. Later on, European colonies would be nominally controlled by the nations that founded them, but the viceroys and governors they sent out were largely independent in what they could do, just so long as they kept the tax money flowing back to Europe. In either case, a colony is different to an invasion in that the colony brings in a significant population from the origin country and uses that population to fill every rank of society, not just the ruling class. Because of that, colonial nations tend to be more stable than invasion-based nations, although there is some overlap depending on how many colonizers there are and what the population ratio is between them and the locals. Successor States Sometimes, an empire will fracture into pieces, either all at once or over the course of a hundred years or so. Other times, an empire will get conquered, and rather than taking over all of their territory, the victors will carve the empire into arbitrary pieces. Alexander's empire was divvied up by his generals, Charlemagne's empire was split between his sons, the Ottoman empire was cut to pieces after World War I, and a dozen nations seceded from the USSR in 1991. As the remnants of an empire, successor states retain a lot of influence from that empire. However, they also have a lot more local influence than they did under the larger government, and the longer they stay independent, the more they will diverge from the other successors. Sometimes this process is slow, like with the bad blood that slowly built up between France and the Holy Roman Empire, and other times that process is fast, like with the divergence between Ptolemy Egypt and Seleucid Persia. In the latter case, the two nations were really only unified briefly, and so even though their rulers were both Greek in culture, the nations quickly reverted back to their old ways. Reunification Every now and then, a group of successor states will merge back together to form a new empire. This new empire will not be the same government as the old one, but it will often claim to be a continuation of the old empire, or else some new incarnation of it. Still, it is a new nation, or at least it is as far as this video is concerned. The Han and Jin dynasties were not just different families on the same throne, they were different governments with different administration styles. It's important to note, however, that reunification generally only happens when all the nations involved have the same or similar cultures. Japan will unify, fracture, and then unify again because all of the people involved still think of themselves as Japanese whereas the Roman Empire split and never reunified because the only people who considered themselves Roman were the ones living in central Italy. So whether the nations of your setting are old or young, vibrant or dying, they all have an origin story that informs their culture and helps define their relationship with their neighbors. So if nations are in any way important to the stories you want to tell, it's a good idea to know where they came from. Thanks for joining me again for today's journey into weaving worlds. Please like, share, and subscribe because that raises my visibility here on YouTube. Check out my other stuff if you have some time. Support me on Patreon if you have some money. And I hope I'll see you again for the next video.